For those of you who know us, you know that we're our real property advisors is a 60-person uh, operation, operates here in New York City. Uh, I have actually five more partners, and these are Victor Sozio, uh, Mike Tortorici, Ivan Petrovich, uh, Paul McCormick, and Sean uh, Kelly. And if you don't know them and us, please reach out and get to know us a little bit better. We have a lot to say and a tremendous amount of information. We started this business as an investment sales group back in the day, about 13 years ago, and we carved New York City to specific sub-markets. Each one of our investment professionals focuses on that sub-market, what we think is the ultimate expertise. And we layered it with capital services professionals, mortgage brokers, who work in tandem with uh, the uh, investment sales professionals to provide even better service to the same clients. And we pride ourselves at Ariel Property Advisors to be advisory first. And we've established a research group, about half of our 30, our 60 person operation, 30 of us, are research analysts and sales support. And that means that much of the information that you have here is from that group, it's, it's in front of you. And again, please feel free to reach out. One of the things we try to do at Ariel is work with intention and our mission calls for that. We, Talk about empowerment, empowerment of our clients with information, empowerment of our employees, and also being involved in empowering the communities we work with. And today, I'm very excited to have one of our nonprofit partners, Legal Outreach, and I'd like to invite first the founder, James O'Neill, to please come to the stage. And as James is walking towards the stage, I would like him, I would like to tell you that Legal Outreach is an after-school program that's doing a fantastic work with underserved kids in, in neighborhoods here in New York City. And what they do is they have a specific program over years that prepares these kids to go to the best colleges in the United States, and close to 100% of them graduate. James started this organization about 40 years ago, and um, right after law school, he made a decision to dedicate his life to the betterment of others. And he also decided to retire uh, this year. And we wanted to, to thank him for everything he's done and give him a little bit of a token of our appreciation. And here it is. So James, it's for you. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Are you speaking or Tamika is? I'm going to speak and then I'm going to bring Tamika up. Awesome. All right. Let's go. Fantastic. I'll put it aside for you. So let me just say that uh, I'm extremely grateful to Simone, to Aerial Property Advisors. There's no great nonprofit organization that is able to do meaningful work without partners. And we count Aerial Property Advisors as one of our biggest supporters, one of our biggest partners, not just in terms of making financial contributions to the organization, but providing opportunities for our young people to be exposed to the world of real estate. Um, and these are the types of internships and professional exposure programs that motivate our students so that indeed they are ready to pursue education at the highest level. Um, I am retiring. Um, this has been a great journey, 40 years. I never knew when I started that it would last this long, but it's because of folks like you all, like Aerial Property Advisors, that we've been able to prosper. I am so happy, however, to say that the person that I'm turning um, the mantle of leadership over to is a 22-year veteran of legal outreach who knows the program backwards and forwards. We have 13 different programs. And I'd like to introduce her to come up. Her name is Tamika Edwards. Thank you, James, and thank you, Shimon, for all that you've done over the course of, the, of several years to enhance our programs and more specifically, the lives of our students. You know, we, we know that we have a program that works, we have a good structure that is proven, but our students are only successful because we have partners, we have people, and we have organizations and companies 
that are willing to give a little bit of their time, willing to give a little bit of their knowledge, share their expertise, and share what they do on a daily basis with students, willing to give of their resources, the resources that have been given to them with our students. And so I invite you, all of you, and I thank you all too for um, supporting our students, whether indirectly or directly, some of you have participated in our programming. And I invite you to share a little bit more of your time with our students through our professional exposure program or through our internship program. Our professional exposure program is a two-hour commitment a two-hour commitment where you share a little bit about your career journey, share a little bit about what you do, lend your expertise, um, and for two hours you can make a world of difference with our students. Our internship program is a four-day commitment, and in four days you can do so much, make a big impact. I do have to tell you that one of our six students who are here for, for the week just said to me that learning about real estate is on his bucket list. So if you would like to make the dreams of one of our young students come true, please see me after this event and we can talk about how you can become more involved. Thank you so much. Thank you, James, and thank you, Tamika. And really, if you haven't or if you don't know enough about Legal Outreach, you should learn. It's, it's a great organization. Some of the students are here. They're actually interning with us uh, this week, so, so that's exciting as well. But thank you for everything you guys do. Let's, let's get going. Let's start talking about New York City's real estate market, at least in the past six months. And it's been a ride. I mean, we, we've seen the transaction volume drop by 43%, about $13 billion. Uh, and, and we weren't surprised about it. We weren't surprised about it. That's something we expected. What we didn't expect are bank failures, and we didn't expect the speed at which some office landlords are going to hand over keys to lenders. And that wasn't because of any economic downturn. It was because some structural changes took place in New York City and, and beyond that. And these are the underlying fundamentals in office, regulation in the multifamily asset class as well as land, and the cost of capital, specifically interest rates. And as a result of that, what we've seen in the second quarter, not the first, in the second quarter is a lot more transactions and a lot more velocity of investors that are taking opportunity in the New York City lower basis real estate market. And I want to start with the office market because um, it, it's it's, it has been some, something active and, and, and we talked about the fundamentals. We've seen a 50% occupancy only compared to pre-pandemic levels. In the past six months, we saw only $2.4 billion of transactions that took place. As you can see from this chart, it's the, probably one of the lowest periods in 10 years. And uh, we're trying to figure out or see if there's any other clues that can direct us to what, who's doing what in terms of investing. And these clues come when you look at mortgage maturities and the behavior of the owners of these very large buildings, very smart owners. And what they do is interesting. If the building is almost vacant, if they don't see a future in it, and they don't believe that the value is where it should be or will be, they let that building go. And we've seen many of them, like RxR and LNL and Related and Blackstone, do exactly that in the past six months. And these are really smart groups. However, if the buildings are class A, very low vacancy, high rents, mostly new, they actually do everything they can upon mortgage maturity to hold on to these assets. And that's the first opportunity that we see in office buildings. And these are buildings that were held on to, and they're held on to by extending mortgages or bringing new equity and paying down some debt in different iterations of that. You see SL Green, for example, is a good example. 245 Park Avenue was just recapitalized. Not only is SL Green held on to this asset, they also managed to find new investors at a 9% discount compared to their 2017 level. So that's the first opportunity we see in office, investing class A, great locations, office buildings that are distressed just because of interest rates. The second opportunity in office that investors uh, see is in the repositioning or the double trouble but with the future. And this repositioning 
come with buying buildings at a discount today. And these are just three examples of those. In addition to that, we've seen some companies that believe in New York City long term and invest in their own buildings, like NYU and Enchante and Hyundai. And they joined by Google uh, last year. So this is another opportunity. Another opportunity is life sciences, which is a specific uh, sector of the market of office. And Chris Balestra from Taconic here is going to actually tell us more about it because that's one of the things they do and they do it pretty well. And the last thing are conversions from office to residential. Not very active because it's really hard to do. So the office market does have opportunity and does have investors. You just have to figure out at which buildings. So if only 50% of us go to the office, we probably use our houses a lot more, and that helps the multifamily market. The second quarter of this year was robust. The first quarter was very, very low, but the second quarter was robust, close to $4 billion of multifamily transactions in New York City. And when I say multifamily transactions, we have to really qualify it. It's not just one aspect, it's three. It's free market, it's affordable housing, and it's rent stabilized. Free market was 51% of all multifamily transactions. The investor bench there is super deep. I mean, we're talking about pretty much everybody, institutions, private clients, international investors. And the reason is because rents, the underlying fundamentals are strong. It's because of the demand to the city, but it's also because of the housing supply. The low housing supply creates that scenario. We know that the 421A, the tax abatement that allows developers to build rental housing with uh, uh, being financially feasible, that's gone at this point. So we will continue to see rent growth, and we've seen it in the past year at 10% in prime locations. These are just four buildings that traded in the past quarter, not the past six months, just recently, and you see the type of investors putting a lot of money into free market. It's Carlisle, it's Stonehenge, it's Numdar, which is private, it's Slate, which is a combination, and Geo. The rent stabilized market, not doing as great. And it's not because uh, the, of the housing policy that took place in 2019. You see, the housing policy does not allow rent or rent stabilized units to increase even upon vacancy. And as a result, only 15% of all multifamily transactions were in that category. But New York City is New York City, so there's always an investor in these. And those who invest are private people who understand the product, understand the politics, and most importantly, have a very long term horizon. And the reason they invest is twofold. Number one, pricing. Pricing dropped between 2014, 15, and 16 to today. These are three examples. 30% drop in values entices some people to buy in. The second reason is because the regulatory environment, we think, and others, is unsustainable. It creates a lot of different issues, mostly vacancy. Landlords prefer, in many cases, to keep the units vacant. And we have tens of thousands of rent-stabilized units vacant in the city. And the second reason is there's no incentive for the landlord to put money into the units and the buildings. So over time, we'll see buildings dilapidate. And we think that at some point, things will have to change. We started seeing some rent-stabilized conversions into affordable housing based on some new regulation. It's just the beginning. It's a step in the right direction. We're not sure exactly where it's going to go. But if we talk about affordable housing, let's jump, jump right into it. And these are buildings that are, have regulatory agreements on the one hand and income restrictions on the other. There are 34% of all uh, multifamily transactions and um, super, super interesting uh, phenomena. The investors here are either private individuals or mission-driven capital. Double bottom line, they want the financial profit, but they also want to do the right thing when it comes to social responsibility. Eleonora from Vistria here is a prominent developer and, and investor, actually, uh, through Vistria and other places uh, in her career, and I'm excited to hear you speak about that specific market. So why would Eleonora or others invest in New York City affordable? The first reason is the relatively lower property taxes and incentives there. The second is the opportunity to add value, specifically if it's vouchered tenants, 
because of the strong fundamentals on New York City. And the third is agency lenders are the key here. So this kind of asset class wasn't affected as much by bank failures in the past six months. And we've seen that. We've seen really interesting transactions take place. We've seen Nuveen, which is another mission-driven uh, group, buying the Omni uh, portfolio or platform for close to a billion dollars. Uh, our company, our real property advisors, um, was involved or represented the seller in the CPARC portfolio earlier this year, 818 units, $150 million land in addition to develop. And that's in addition to closing on 800 units um, and 5,000 units that we currently have in the inventory, which will trade either this year or next year. You want more information, talk to my partner, Victor Sozio. But there's a much, much needed demand from an investor perspective in the affordable world, and we believe we'll keep seeing that moving uh, forward. So that kind of summarizes the existing buildings. Let's talk about the construction of housing and land. And we've seen a drop in volume there too. And the reason for that is no tax abatement to develop rentals. Construction costs are much higher today, and it's harder to develop condos and sell condos because of interest rates. And so what are the opportunities, or at least what did we see that traded in the past six months that developers were all over? The first thing is prime locations. These are, you know, the St. Francis College, for example, that traded earlier this year and could be a condo or could be a rental eventually. Maybe it's a land banking opportunity. But prime locations getting good activity. The second is rezoning locations. We've seen that in Queens. The third are, is land that does have the 421A vested. Developers are paying premium for that. We just heard that the governor wrote or signed an executive order, and that means that the Gowanus is going to continue to have an extended 421A for a while. We probably will see more of that, of the vested 421A transactions coming soon. And the last thing is affordable housing. When the city and state cooperate and provide developers what they need, you see very large developers actually do affordable housing, like Taconic and Silverstein and L&M and, uh, and Slate. So land is an opportunity as long as the legislator cooperate, understands the economics, and willing to provide the incentives to these developers. Industrial, we've seen a drop in volume of transactions, but the fundamentals are very strong. Rent have gone up and the supply is constrained. We'll probably continue to see opportunity there. Retail rents have dropped compared to pre-pandemic. The pandemic, however, the opportunity there is in residential areas. We've seen that in the, past, uh, in the past year and we'll continue to see that moving forward. Hotel fundamentals are super strong and they're super strong because of the supply constraint. We have less rooms in, um, in hotels post pandemic and migrants are taking some of these rooms as well. We do have the tourism back which increases average daily rates and lowers vacancy so fundamentals are strong. What we've seen in the past six months are smaller hotels trading at a premium, which was very interesting. So the hotel market is doing well. It's back to where it was kind of pre-2019. What should we watch for in the next, let's say, six months? Well, the first thing is the regional lending that's in transition. And we are very fortunate to have Kurt Stewart here with us today. He's a lender, a small lender, actually, Chase. Um, and he's going to talk to us about what he's seeing there. What we're seeing is that balance sheet lenders are having harder time to put money out. And the opportunities for the private lenders, we've seen the Apollos of the world, the Meta West, lending on things or lending on assets they couldn't really compete for before. Well, what else we're seeing? We spoke about mortgage maturities, but I think that's the one aspect that is going to force many, many decisions and going to force a lot of transactions. You see, if if, if a landlord cannot refinance, they are going to possibly sell. If there's an issue between a landlord and a borrower, there's probably going to be some kind of workout. The opportunity there, we spoke about it in the office market, we're gonna see it also in the residential market, mostly in the rent stabilized market, but the opportunity is going to be in assets that have great fundamentals, 
but are dislocated from a pricing perspective because of interest rates. So jumping into those or investing into those is what investors are looking for today. The other thing that I'm going to mention about mortgages is that the FDIC is going to sell the signature portfolio sometimes this year. That's about $20 billion. And I think that's going to be a parameter for the market in many cases of pricing and how it's absorbed in the market. And the last thing is the housing policy. And I asked Anthony and Adam to put together a, a slide uh, with all the bullet points for the housing policy. This is the housing policy. And the reason is there's nothing in the budget. Um, and it's an issue. However, we do have a glimmer of hope. Uh, we just know about the executive order, which might help the Gowanus and a few other areas, not necessarily New York City, but it's, it's a good step in the right direction. It's definitely not enough. We are short about 380,000 residential units in New York City, and we're told we'll be short about you know, 600,000 by the year 2030. So we definitely need to encourage developers to develop and give that, those incentives. To wrap it up, we have great demand factors and robust or relatively robust economy and growth. However, the ch there are macro challenges, you know, office occupancy, interest rates, regulation, all of that. As a result, smart capital is starting to invest in buildings and assets that are repriced. We probably will continue to see that in a bigger way by the end of the year and through 2024. So that concludes my presentation, and thank you for listening.